So, hello to everyone tuning in from around the world for this panel. It's a privilege and on a personal level, just very exciting indeed to be joined here today by Paul Schrader and Oscar Isaac for this discussion about their upcoming movie, The Card Counter. So we're gonna talk a bit about the movie, which unfortunately had to go on production hiatus with only five days left to shoot due to the pandemic. Um, it will, however, still be taking part in the Cannes Marche next week. Um, and we'll find out a bit about the plan to get things rolling again. And we'll also chat generally about the film and we'll be leaving plenty of time for some audience questions. We received a, a huge response, so thank you to everyone for that. Um, I think these two gentlemen need no introduction, so without further ado, let's dive right in. Um, Paul, you had to pause shooting on the movie in mid-March due to the virus. Um, one of your actors tested positive, unfortunately. Um, you only had five days left. Um, that must have been frustrating, I imagine. Do you know yet when you'll be able to resume? Uh, they're talking about letting us start after Fourth of July, July sixth, and to prep the week before, we've been cleared by SAG, and Mississippi wants us back. So fingers crossed. In this environment, it's almost impossible to take anything for granted. But uh, we're we're proceeding, and um, fortunately, we had completed our crowd scenes and our intimate scenes, and uh, and it was, was one of our crowd scenes that brought the hammer down, we had 500 extras that I sent to the AD, One, someone here has to have the virus. And someone did, one of the extras. And uh, we found out a couple of days later, and that was that. I, I fancied for a moment not telling anybody and shooting until they explained to me in very explicit terms what the legal ramifications would be. <laughs> I'm shooting and not telling the crew that someone had the virus. But I'm, I'm hopefully a, a full recovery has been made by that uh, member of the cast? As far as I've heard, not a recovery in my mind, but in his mind, I'm sure. Clean bill of health then. Um, so, so when the movie does come back, <laughs> um, I assume you will have to introduce you know, numerous coronavirus guidelines and, and, and changes to the set, things like distancing. Um, how challenging has that been to figure that out? Well, you know, I think we've, we've all read the protocols. They are onerous, to say the least. I would not want to start a film from scratch under those conditions. But five days and uh, knowing exactly what you need, exactly what you want, um, you can work your way through that, uh, li rather limp your way through it and which is what we'll do it'll end up seeming like a kind of adventure whereas for another production starting from scratch it would seem like a nightmare absolutely and it, so it sounds like you've shot um your crowd scenes you know the the film is about a uh, a card shark who plays in some big poker tournaments i imagine you know we've seen the vegas um covid safe casinos now so i imagine that would be very difficult to shoot in but you, we you only have one casino day left, and both those scenes are in bars where the slots and tables are in the distance. So I think we'll be able to uh, get away with it. Okay, good. And ha have you had to rewrite anything? I've not had to, but had the uh, luxury. Um, you know, I, I made this 90-minute cut. Uh, well, this 90% cut. And then we had simulations of the unshot scenes. And there were three substantial dialogue scenes that we hadn't shot yet. So then I showed it to people and invited the reactions and showed it to Scorsese and Oscar and other people and say, look, I've got three scenes here. Uh, they don't have to be the scenes I've written, you know. I can change these characters based on what we've learned by making the film. And I, I can tweak them. And so that's what I've done. And Oscar, as an actor, I mean, how do you feel about this new, hopefully temporary reality of production? I don't know, because I've just been sitting here waiting. So I don't know what it's going to be like. I know, I know what's being um, talked about, but the actual reality of what that'll be like when I get to set, um, you know, what those protocols are gonna be like 
it's really but, hard to you know, I, I, obviously Oscar they're going to try to keep you apart from your other actors uh, only one person can have be in immediate contact with the, an actor at a time so it's hair makeup wardrobe props uh director ad we, we, we all have to stand in the queue to get near you and if i'm right close to you i can't look you in the eye we have to look in a different direction that's nice. just the beginning so basically this is like bruce willis's contract right <laughs> Everybody has it. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, this, uh, I don't know, man. I mean, it's, yeah, it sounds, it sounds exhausting, really. Well, I guess. Because I'm, I'm very much somebody that, you know, like, wants to interact and talk and kind of, you know, I'm a hugger. So, uh, you know, it'll, uh, I'll have to try to kind of take on some of those more kind of Scandinavian qualities. That yeah, ho has. hopefully next year in Jerusalem, huh? <laughs> right, exactly. Well, brave new world. Um, Oscar, let me ask you a little bit about your, your lockdown experience. I mean, what, how have you been keeping yourself busy? Have you been reading a lot of scripts? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's funny because um, I guess now that they know everyone's just sitting around at home, there's been kind of a deluge of things coming uh, that's more theoretical. You know, it's like people are saying, all right, let's announce this thing. But there's, it's, it's not a reality. There's no date. There's no time when we even really can say, okay, you know, this is when we're going to start shooting. So in a way, it just feels like it's, it's more about trying to, you know, all of us non-essentials trying to keep our spirits up a little bit by dream, dreaming about what we might be doing. But um, it's been actually for me, because I have just been constantly working. I'm unable, I've been unable to really put the brakes on, even though I've wanted to, but just I have a compulsion to keep going. <laughs> Uh, to be forced to take some time uh, and, uh, you know, kind of reassess the whole thing has been really, I think for me, helpful um, as a human, as an actor. I've, I, now I can't even imagine going back to work. Uh, now that I, I see what it's like not to work, I'm like, why the fuck did I work for so long? Jesus, this is great. So, uh, no, but it's been, it's been nice. It's been nice to be with the family and be home. Um, and and I think to be living through this kind of socio-political singularity that's occurring, you know, from everyone being closed up, locked up because of the virus, and then seeing what happened with George Floyd and everyone taking to the streets because we're social animals and, you know, we needed to be together. And, you know, the, just this, this thing that's happening that would not have happened if everybody was too busy living their own, you know, lives, going back to work. So, so it's, uh, yeah, it's been really... Uh, strange, to say the least. Yeah, cool. Well, it sounds like you've enjoyed it. So going back to set in a couple of weeks, um, that will be interesting for you. Um, but Paul, maybe you could tell us a bit about your, your lockdown experience as well. I mean, it sounds like you've been in full post-production mode. Um, have you been able to, to get a cut of the movie? Yeah, I have a cut of the movie. My editor is in New Jersey, so this is how we edit. Uh, my composers are in London. Uh, but one of the things is, you know, normally in a film, there's such intense pressure to make deadlines and dates, but there's no pressure now. Nobody knows when this film is going to be released, if it will be released. Um, so without a looming deadline, things just sort of happen at a slower pace. You know, somebody, I, I, you know, that somebody will have to take a couple of days off, should sure, take a couple of days off. Um, and uh, because I'm not crazy about trying to release a film this year, I don't, I, I, will, I, I will believe Venice and Toronto and tell you right when I see them. Um, you know, it doesn't take much to stop those festivals, just like it was with Khan. So I, I, I don't know what the urgency is. And, uh, and that also affects your ability to write new material. Because you're saying, you know, I'll write a new script, then what am, what am I going to do with it? <laughs> mm -hmm. So have you been doing a lot of writing? I'm working on a new idea uh, about gardening. 
about horticulture. Okay, that's very, very relevant to the moment. I mean, I, I, that's all I've been doing, so uh, <laughs> makes sense. Um, Some people think that's what Hamlet's about, <laughs> gardening. Yeah. Well, so so let, let, let's talk a little bit about, about um, let, let's give people a, a taster of the card counter then. Um, let's talk a bit about its themes. So it, it, it follows this guy who's a kind of low key card shark with a dark past who starts playing higher stakes poker. Um, Paul, where did this story come from? Well, you know, I'm always looking for a metaphor for something. I am not really that interested in taxi drivers or in drug dealers or in society walkers or in ministers uh, or boxers, but they are great metaphors, great occupational metaphors. So you have a kind of a theme that you're nothing around with. In this case, the theme is, is guilt. Is there any, if one is truly guilty, is there really any end to punishment, self-punishment? Uh, if you're a certain type of person. And uh, and then you start thinking, what would be a metaphor for that? And watching World Series of Poker, I said, this is it. This is a way to not exist. You just sit here and you run numbers 12 hours a day or sit in front of a slot machine and mechanically play hour after hour. And it's like you found a successful way not to exist. So what would a person who doesn't want to kill himself, but doesn't really feel he deserves to exist, what kind of occupation would he vector toward? So that's how the idea began. Okay. And I mean, did you go back and consult previous movies about gambling? Any kind of key inspirations? Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> you know, uh, obviously most, and all gambling movies are about being a winner. And this is not about winning in that way. Uh, but, um, uh, yeah, no, there, there, are, there are a lot of them. And, uh, you know, I watched them all. There's only a handful of good ones. But, uh, but uh, yeah, I can't say that. I, I can't say that Clark Connor is a poker movie any more than Taxi Driver is about a cabbie. Yeah, understood. Um, and I, I don't want to give anything away, but it's also quite a political film. Um, I'm curious to know, how do you go about making a movie with political themes in the middle of, of such a turbulent time? Well, the political themes here really, and they're from the past, the near past, but the past. And they're really about morality collapses, failure of human morality, uh, not a failure of political systems. What happens when human morality collapses under pressure? from a larger system. And what does that do to the person? And we live in a culture now where everybody thinks they get a free ride. You know, you can be Harvey Weinstein, you can be Donald Trump, but hey, I misspoke. I didn't mean it. I made a mistake. Not like I did anything wrong. I just misspoke. I just put my hand in the wrong place. How can you blame me? Well, I wanted to do a character who felt the opposite, who felt it was me, and I did do the wrong thing, and they punished me, and it wasn't enough. Okay, and tell, tell me about when Oscar first came into your thinking for the role. Well, I, I've been thinking about Oscar for a long time. I've tried to do three different films in Mexico. All of them fell through. And one of them, I screen tested Oscar and chose him. And then the company Maya collapsed. So he was always sort of on the fringe of my memory. And then Ex Machina, you know, was like a uh, lightning bolt performance. 
And so I was even thinking of him for first report. And uh, in my mind, I shifted to Ethan uh, for those kind of vague reasons that we all do. And, uh, but this one came around and uh, I said this, and you know, when you make films like I do, when you make low budget, self-sacrifice films, you can't, you have to go to people you know. I don't know Brad Pitt. I could send the script to Brad, Brad Pitt and it would fall into a bottomless pit, Brad's pit. And uh, maybe three months later, I would get some kind of comment about someone in his organization that read it. But I knew Oscar, I knew Ethan. So you can call them up and say, I've written a script for you. Will you read it and give me an answer quickly? If not, I won't send it. And if they say yes, then you know you're going to get an answer. And uh, so that's the uh, upside of having been around a while, is that you actually have the phone numbers and emails of a number of people you want to work with. Cool. So Oscar, you, you get the call from Paul and he says, I've got this new movie I'd like you to star in. I mean, what was the process behind you attaching yourself and, and why did the character attract you? Well, yeah, I actually I tracked down some of the old exchanges Paul and I had had. This was 10 years ago. I had, you know, I had just, you know, I had basically just been out of school for a few years and I was out in LA and I remember I, I got the audition and I went to some strip mall that Paul had ensconced himself into like a little theater drama school for the day or you know a couple days and transformed it into a space you know uh, to hold auditions and he had even created some of the sets where you'd go in and audition so just that process alone was so fascinating and and uh, and then we hit it off and he cast me and he even sent me the auditions on a little DVD so I could see the other audition people that auditioned as well and that's the thing with Paul is just there, as you know as everyone knows he's direct <laughs> and there isn't a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes it's like he's very upfront and direct with his process and what he wants and what he likes and what he doesn't like and uh, and then that thing fell through but we stayed in touch and we would email now and then and um, and then there was a it looked like even just from looking at the emails there was about an eight year gap where we just didn't didn't speak them for a bit and that's when I saw then I had seen first performed and I just was completely blown away by it uh just in awe of the mastery of it the restraint the weirdness of the thing and um you know it just felt strangely it just felt so much newer and bolder than anything else that was that was that's been released. It was my favorite thing that I'd seen. So I tracked down his email and I wrote to, to Paul and then he wrote back. And then a year later, I remember I was just walking down the street with my wife and we were looking at well, strollers or something. <laughs> and, uh, and I got the email from Paul, which was exactly what he just said, almost word for word. I've written, it was, I've written a script for you. Well, not just you, but, <laughs> but for you as well. And, you know, it's part of my man alone in his room um, you know, storytelling, uh, like, like light sleeper and American gigolo and taxi driver. And, uh, were you, you know, are you in a place where you'd want to take a look at it? And I immediately said, absolutely. Send it to me right away. We're expecting a, a child, but I'm sure we can work around that. <laughs> and, uh, and then, uh, he sent me the script and I, I remember thinking this is black as pitch and mysterious and I don't really understand it. It has, the ambiguity and power of of religious text uh but uh it was undeniable and uh and so i immediately we immediately got into conversation i said of course i'd want to do this i've been wanting to work with you for as long as i've you know been an actor and uh and then we got the ball rolling on on getting it done and getting it cast and and figuring it out and um and it was it's, I was, I felt like I had been a man in a desert for the last many years because I've, you know, been serving um, these kind of bigger films and, and different types screen, of films. A blue screen desert. That's right. A blue screen desert. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, and then to be able to, to kind of engage in material that had, um, that gives the space 
to actually do something. I remember talking to Willem uh, before I had even uh, signed on to this uh, and about how he chooses things. And he says, well, you know, it's sometimes it's not even about the script and not even about the director. It's about, is there space to do something? Is there room to do something in it? And that's what Paul does. He kind of sets up a scenario, um, a, you know, uh, circumstances, and then with the text that he writes that is uh, sometimes so strange and jarring and doesn't seem to go from point A to point B, but goes from point A to point 10 to point Z to point, you know, uh, that uh, the engaging of all those things together creates, um, it creates surprise, like it surprises yourself, you know, and it, it, it really feels like what the way that thought works. And I don't know how it happens, but he's able to create the space for real thought to emerge. And you're not just reciting lines and trying to portray this or express that or communicate anything. You, you know, something really unusual happens. Uh, and I hadn't felt that in years and years and years. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, for me, you know, I've been writing this kind of elliptical disjointed stuff and and people would hammer at me and you know make it clearer make it simpler and then i did that film with harold pinter and working with harold i realized no 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 this is exactly how you do it you know this is the right way this is, this is the way you're supposed to do it mm -hmm. yeah and that's exactly what it reminds me of it's very pinteresque in that way where where it, so much needs to be brought to the table. So, so um, you know, because the the text is so strange and it it, um, it needs you to fill it, and um, and he gives you the space to do that. So one of the, you know we talked about two of the things that we talked about in preparation that I think for me really was the key in figuring this thing out. One, it, it's a reference in the script, which is this book, Meditations uh, by Marcus Aurelius, and. Uh, and then the other one was um, the body keeps the score uh, about trauma, and um, and the way that trauma affects people, and um, and those. I actually I, I read it both of these books, and then I started listening to them uh, when I'd go to sleep because it felt like part of thought a thought process that that this guy's having a lot of. And I think both of them are. It's like, well, what do you do with trauma? specifically trauma that you have caused, you know, not just that's been done to you. Uh, and a lot of it is about trying to work through it. Um, you know, Marcus Meditations, Paul mentioned that a lot of people in prison, it's, it's a book that people gravitate to because uh, it deals with tragedy and how you get over tragedy and, um, uh, you know, what, how to live a life, a moral life. Um, what's also interesting with Meditations is that uh, since this is a, you know, I think William Tell to a certain point, you know, as far as he's concerned, his life is done. So this new life, when he gets out, what's it going to be? And it's a, it's a, it's a construction, you know, so he starts to write just like Marcus Aurelius was writing, you know, his, his own meditations and he dresses the way that he thinks like, um, uh, uh, just like a neutral good man can dress that he's neither, you know, the, the, it gives little information to what he is or who he is. And uh, but yeah, so th those are those are a couple of key things that, uh, that I, I kind of keyed into. Sounds fascinating. Uh, Paul, why did you call the character William Tell? Well, he had to have a gnome to poker because he doesn't he, his previous name is stigmatized by his actions. And so you say, okay, um, when people change their names, like in the WITSEC program, they usually keep their first, they change their last. And so his first name was Tillich, like Paul Tillich, the theologian. And I said, okay, now I'm going to change Tillich. And then the pun of a Tell in poker and a William Tell in Swiss history. Uh, was just kind of delightful. Cool. And Oscar, I know you were an excellent musician before you made uh, Inside Llewellyn Davis. Um, could you play cards before you made this movie? A little bit. Not not well. You know, I, I, I played a bit, but but not well. No. 
the, the character is, is uh, you know, he does card tricks and he's, he's, he's clearly a dab hand with this kind of stuff. Um, how did you go about learning those things? Well, I had a, um, a couple different cardists, card mechanics uh, come over and start teaching me some basic manipulations of cards. And, uh, and then um, met with a, uh, a really uh, great poker player. But, so, know, yes, I met. Sorry, go ahead. I was interrupting Oscar. Um, Joe Stapleton, who uh, has a kind of contract with uh, uh, Poker Kings or one of these channels. Anyway, he's got me into it. I now play twice a week on Zoom with approximately 40 or 50 players. And you see all the players up there. It starts out with five or six tables. And um, it doesn't cost much money. The most you can lose is about 40 to 50 bucks at a night. And it's a, a whole new social group. We call it Club Quarantine, <laughs> which um, uh, has evolved out of this Biloxi experience. And there'll be a game again tonight. And if you're, if you're interested in joining Club Quarantine, I mean, I'm sure they'll be glad to have you. Nice, man. I mean, that's, that's amazing. Joe, yeah, Joe was, was a really good resource. But you know what the best resource was for me was I, I stayed in the casino where we were shooting. So mm -hmm. I would go down after you know, when we were getting ready and even uh, during in between setups of different t uh, scenes, I'd go to the poker table and just play with the people there and, you know, lose some money or or some every once in a while win a little bit. And uh, that really helped because you just start picking up on the flow and the details of what you do with your hands, how you shuffle the chips, how do you collect the pot, uh, things that you just wouldn't normally think of, or even when you watch on TV, they usually cut that stuff out. They're just kind of going straight to the hand. So all the interstitial kind of boring bits of what you do, uh, that was really fun to watch. And I think it also, it's what Paul's interested in, in this, even having seen a cut is, uh, it's like the, the faces and the hands and the, the felt and the, the more mundane aspects of it that actually make it seem like such a weird, surreal, almost like bizarre anthropological study of these animals at this table, what are they doing? Mm -hmm. uh, and and that, was, that was really fun to do. And then, yeah, and then just working a bunch on trying to get a few of the card tricks and, and get facile with that. So you, did, you didn't lose your shirt then? That would have been taking method acting to a... No, no, no I just, I, I play within my means. Okay. Yeah, well, um, there, you, know, you know, there are, Paul Dano is in this club quarantine group, but there are a number of Hollywood guys who play in these groups, but uh, they tend to play to the point where someone gets hurt. And, uh, mm. and I, to me, that takes the play out of it. Is, this, it sounds like the plot of uh, Molly's Game. Oh, I saw that film, but I don't remember it. About uh, high stakes poker, um, lots of uh, film people. Uh, all, a, all a bit uh, high stakes for me, I expect. Um, Paul, I wanted to ask you about um, Martin Scorsese, uh, you know, teaming up with you again for this movie uh, as an executive producer. What, what was his influence on the project? It was a favor. Um, you know, Marty and I stay in touch. We have dinner once or twice a year. And um, we've remained friends, even though, you know, the concept of collaboration became impossible quite a while back. Uh, and, you know, Marty has been producing films <clears throat> as a way to be a sponsor, but also as a way to make money. Because when he takes a producing credit, he gets a fee. So I called him up and I said, Mark, I think it would be cool if we could have a card that says, <clears throat> Martin Scorsese presents a film by Paul Schrader. It would be a kind of capstone to our mutual careers. And uh, I'd like to offer you this, but there's no uh, recompense. You just have to do it because you're a nice guy. And he said, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> so that's how it happened. <laughs> and uh, and then, uh, then I was able to show him the, the cut that we now have. And he, he then sent voluminous notes as he does uh, about all the things that 
realistically we could change. You know, there's nothing worse than getting notes from someone who doesn't understand that this change is not possible realistically. You know, you're not going to change. You're not going to recast the bartender. It's not going to happen. <laughs> I remember when I when I wrote about his involvement that um, you said that the two of you had a, a mutual love of handmade films. Uh, what, what did you mean by that? Well, uh, probably me more than him, because he's done quite a few that have come through the studio process. But he has managed to keep control in a way that defies expectation. Uh, you know, Harry Weinstein couldn't lay a hand on him. Netflix couldn't lay a hand on him. Uh, his whole career, he has been very deft at getting money out of people's pockets and not having them angry at him. Interesting. Uh, something I've not done as well. Um, and Oscar, I just wanted to pick up on something you said earlier, um, kind of referencing these, you know, uh, huge franchise movies that you've been in, obviously enormously successful. Um, but is, does it make a nice change to go back to something kind of more indie, like the card counter? Do those kind of projects get you more excited now? Yes. Succinct? Um Yes, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I enjoyed the challenge of, of those films and working with, you know, a very large group of uh, incredible artists and actors and, and prop makers and, you know, set designers and all that. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it was really fun, but uh, it's not really um, what I set out to do. You know, what I really was set out to do was to, to, um, to make hand, handmade movies <laughs> and to uh, work with people that inspired me. I mean, Paul's movies, the things that he's made, it's in my DNA, you know, as, and I'm not alone, obviously. <laughs> every, every actor that, uh, that was, was, you know, certain generation, it's like that, those are the films that made them who they are. And so that, that's certainly my case. So, so yeah, it's, um, you know, it was, it feels like a, for me, just a personal turning point. And, and, and that it really, it, as far as I'm concerned, it has nothing to do with the finished product. It's the it's the process and the process of doing this. I mean, we just shot, it was really just a little over three weeks and, and yet it was so uh, immersive that it feels like having done a six month film on one of these, you know, big movies. Ch cheeky question, but does that reduce the chances of a return for Poe Dameron one day? Um, probably, but you know, who knows? I need another house or something. <laughs> um, and Oscar, um, Deadline announced a couple of other movies uh, you're, you're doing, um, uh, the new James Gray film, Armageddon Time, Ben Stiller's London. Um, what, what is the plan for those? Like, are you, are you hoping that the world will have returned kind of back to normal before you embark on these projects? I think it's, it's, it's kind of like I said earlier, you know, it's, um, it's talking to people that I admire and James Gray is always someone that I've really uh, liked a lot and, and have been uh, excited to, to find the project to work on together. And we started talking during this thing. And at first, you know, he had thought maybe he could start shooting at the end of the year. And then obviously that got pushed. And, and so I said, yeah, let's, let's keep talking about this thing. And if I can, you know, help, help get this thing made and, and, um, be a part of it I'd love to but again it is it is more about we hope that this will be something that comes together that we can do uh, the same thing with uh, London which is something that I actually put together because I'd gotten I'd read this short story I thought it was really fascinating I had I had lunch with Ben Stiller we talked about a bunch of different things and I told him about this one and he thought that was an interesting thing too and then I happened to be talking to Eric Roth because he was doing some rewrites on Dune and I mentioned that to him and then that it just kind of organically came together and uh and then we talked to Lionsgate and they, they said cool let's uh let's let's make this movie we'll we'll pay Eric to write it and so he's gonna go off and write it and then and then we'll we'll see where that goes but uh yeah you know it's um and then I, as far as the announcing of it I don't know you know I think it's just to kind of drum up excitement and to keep oh and it's just because of the, the virtual con market yeah 
Exactly. So it's 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 all that, you know. The, uh, speaking of doom, uh, where do you sit with that? The, the we're going to do some additional shooting in August. August, where? In mid 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 August. Uh, they're saying uh, Hungary. Hungary. In Budapest. Yeah. Cool. Have you seen anything? So I, I saw some things cut together and it just, it looks amazing. You know, then he, then he's a real, real artist. So yeah, it'll be exciting to see it come together, but it's, it's kind of wild that we're doing some additional shooting a few months before it's supposed to come out, <laughs> you know, but we did that. That happened with star Wars as well. Yeah, of course, of course. And doubly wild now in the kind of pandemic world as well, I would imagine. But, um, yeah. Paul, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, after such a storied career, you finally received a, in my opinion, long overdue Oscar nomination for First Reformed. I mean, how much did that mean to you? Well, it has certain practical advantages in getting things done. It has no meaning beyond that. As I said at the time, you know, why would I want an award I don't respect? Uh, if you look at the history of Oscar winners, up and down the departments, you know, if they get it right 20% of the time, they're doing good. And so you can sit there and say, I know I had this conversation with Marty years ago. Marty was really had a hard on to get an Oscar. And I said, Marty, you know, if Oscar is your priority, you need a priority reset. Uh, but he did get his Oscar. And, uh, and it does mean a lot in, the, in business terms. Mm -hmm. But I mean, how many writers out there really think that Green Book is better? The first report. Interesting question. Um, I mean, I know I know that you did uh, struggle to finance some of your projects um, for, for, for a few years. I mean, are you, are you finding that easier now? Has that changed? Well, virtually all of them. Um, you know, indie filmmakers sort of like a scavenger dog, wandering around the campsite picking up scraps. Um, the technology has changed that. I can now, that's why there's been a change in my career. I can now write something that I can finance that is financially responsible. In the past, if I had written something like First Reform, it would not have been financially responsible. But I can scale that down to a three and a half million dollar movie and say, look, I'm not going to tell you you're going to get rich, but I can tell you you're not going to get hurt. And that allowed me to move into the territory of Final Cut, which allowed me to move more and more into just what I wanted to do. And right now, you know, I've received a number of offers for multi-series uh, TV episodics. And... And I turned them down. I said, you know, all I really want to do, I'm 74, I got a couple of films left in me. I want to do a few more of these little handmade films that don't cost much, that don't hurt people much if they plop. And, um, and that's how I'd rather finish it out, rather than being in some gigantic writer's room, getting notes from eight producers, five of whom you've met. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's take some questions from our audience members. Um, so Mansour asks, Paul, this is your seventh co collaboration with Willem Dafoe. Um, and also he notes Oscar's second. Um, what do you guys think makes him so special as an actor and a collaborator? Well, Willem is uh, really unique. I mean, truth be told, Actors and directors are most often not friends. They're friendly, but the care and feeding of an actor is something you go through while you direct a film, but not necessarily something you want to go through all year long. 
he has managers and business people and assistants to, to take care of that function. But Willem uh, is actually a friend. I actually see Willem whenever we're in town together, just as friends. So um, uh, he's able to put his ego in a secondary position to be a friend. Not always. Sometimes the ego flares up. But, uh, and also because of his upbringing in the Wooster group, he has, well, first of all, he has a wonderfully agile body, and he, which he can use and manipulate and, and express things with. And that weird physiognomy of his face. And he's really learned how to create original characters with his tools, his physical tools, his verbal schools, uh, his intellectual school, skills. So that, that's what puts him at the top rank of actors who you anticipate what are they going to do? What's Will going to do in this? You know, and on, on this film, he has a very nasty role, and he originally didn't want to do it. And he, then he came back to me and he said, you know, there's something in there. I think I can find something. So uh, I have great affection for Will, both personally and professionally. Cool. That was a long answer. Yeah, good answer. Um, question from Paul. I, I would just say real quick, just something to add, just having done a movie where he's, the camera never leaves his sight, where he's, you know, playing a madman, painter, artist, Van Gogh, uh, and then doing this where he came on basically, was it two, two days, three days, right? Um, that there was absolutely no difference in the approach or the way he behaved. Uh, just the kind of positivity and energy and commitment as well, but also just the ease with which he would go in and out of, you know, doing the scene and then hanging out and talking. And so that, that says a lot because, you know, he, it's like Paul said, he also, you know, obviously we all have egos, but uh, his management of that or whatever neuroses that he has, he leaves that shit at home. And when he shows up, he's just, he's a player. And, uh, I, I, I'm, I was astounded by it and I love, love, love working with them. Incredible screen presence as well. Um, and yeah. a question from Paul from Picture House Entertainment he says, uh, Oscar, discounting the card counter, which Paul Schrader film is your favorite and why? Well, it's, it's um, I mean, it's, it's a tough one because like I said, it's his movies are kind of created me. <laughs> right, Taxi Driver, Raging Bull, you know, uh, I love Mishima because it's a complete, unique thing that's unlike anything else that's ever been made or ever will be. And I really, really love that movie. But First Reformed uh, was such a revelation to me and kind of re-inspired me about uh, this business that I'm in. And, and so I think that at, at the moment that, that for me is really um, the kind of one that I hold in, in the highest regard. Can I, can I put a little plug in for myself? Mm -hmm. Please. Uh, in August, um, Criterion will be releasing a Blu-ray of Cover of Strangers, which was never released properly physically. Dante Spinate shot it in Super 35, and it was released in Crop 35. So finally, 20-some years later, Dante and I are going to be able to present the film the way it was intended to be. And that, that's sometime in August. So save your money. <laughs> that's awesome news. Um, so a question here from Donatella. She says, uh, we are used to seeing Tiffany Haddish in more comedic roles. What was it about her that made you cast her as La Linda? Well, I... Um, I learned something from Marty early on. In Taxi Driver, I had written a kind of nothing role, uh, a beige role for this campaign worker uh, who was just there for expositional reasons. And Marty cast Albert Brooks. 
And, uh, you know, I asked him, I said, why do you cast Albert? He says, because Albert will make something of it. And that's what happens when you cast a comedian in a straight role. They don't do a comic role, but they make something of it that you hadn't seen before because they have a different slant into it. Cool. Um, and uh, Oscar, um, Carly asks, did you have a favorite moment on set? Um, I mean, there's a few, you know, uh, uh, I mean, speaking of Tiffany, getting to make out with Tiffany Haddish wasn't bad. That's, that's up on the list there. Um, go, you know, in between takes, going to actually play poker was, uh, was pretty fun too. I think, uh, one day that, that stands out was, you know, I've worked so hard on this, you know, there's this whole section, a, a monologue. It's a very long scene that goes into all sorts of different directions. And it, it starts off with, a talking about a card game that's very specific and it requires laying out the game and a few tricks that I've been working on for months. Uh, and that also was the day that my family came to visit and it was my birthday. So mm -hmm. kind of all those three things kind of came together. And, you know, if I could say so myself, I don't, maybe Paul disagrees, but I think I nailed it with the card, uh, you know, laying out the card game. And then the scene itself was, incredibly challenging and moving and I, and I thought it all worked out and having my family there was was really special and then I got to eat Thai food afterwards because we were shooting in a Thai restaurant so that was a, that was a special day. Trisha she says how do you want audiences to feel after watching the card counter? I, I've, I've had something I've said for many years which I still believe which is the last scene of a movie occurs on a sidewalk outside the theater if you've done the movie correctly, two people are walking out and one person says, blah, blah, blah. And the other person said, no, 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 that's not right, blah, blah, blah. Well, the movie is then still going on. It's still playing. It's playing on the sidewalk. It's playing on their way to the parking lot. It's playing in the car on their way home. That's how a movie should end. Um, and an another Paul here asking a question. Um, he says, hello from Michigan. How do you think your background and early immersion in religion contributed to the, th to the themes you have chosen to write about? Well, obviously, uh, I circled around at this age to the theme of guilt. Uh, has a lot to do with the fact that I was raised in a guilt-infused theological environment. Uh, one saying I remember from my childhood was, all my best works are filthy rags in the sight of the Lord. Well, if you get raised that way, you, you know, carry along with you these senses of guilt and of how to clean those rags. Okay. And uh, one from Justin here, he says, um, what characters were shared with you, Oscar, um, to prepare you for the role? I guess, you know, any, any iconic film or TV characters that you looked at for this one? Um, uh, Roman Navarro was one. <laughs> A more of a hair reference, but there was something about, uh, you know, Paul shared a really, really cool photo of him that, that, um, that was really uh, a good in, uh, influence. And then we talked a bit about Cincinnati Kid and uh, Steve McQueen in that movie and kind of his uh, icy um, malaise in that one. And uh, um, yeah, th those were two that we, we, we talked about. And then yeah, I, I mean, said, you know, I, I, you know uh, the Navarro hair and the, McQueen, gray, gray blue wardrobe. But then there was another moment. I remember thinking, I was watching the monitor. And then you put on your sunglasses. And I thought to myself, my God, it's Marcello. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I've hired Marcello Mastriotti. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And then just, just finally, Oscar, um, 
I was perhaps expecting a bit more of a, a lockdown beard from you. I mean, you seem to have uh, kept it in check, but I hear it's uh, it's going to have to go again for the uh, for the resumption of shooting. Well, I had it. I had a massive beard, and then I thought we were going to be shooting on the fifteenth. So I was like, well, let me get ready, and then <laughs> I got pushed. So so hence the. Uh, the kind of non-quarantine look <laughs> that I have at the moment. Yeah. Now, Oscar, I've, I've described you in the past as a two-shave-a-day man. Mm-hmm. Are you a two-shave-a-day man? I am definitely a two. This is, this is from, you know, I shaved yesterday. I mean, come on. <laughs> we are going to need some, some, some serious, uh, some, I'm going to have to do some white face in this movie now because I'm like uh, at least five shades darker than I was when we <laughs> shot in February. <laughs> okay, well, well, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, you know, wish you the best of luck for the rest of the shoot and uh, just can't wait to see this movie. All so, right, well, I hope, I hope we kept you entertained. Yes. Yeah, yeah brilliant to talk to you and, uh, you know, take care. Yeah. All right, thanks, Tom. Ciao, ciao. Bye-bye. See you, Paul. Cheers.